Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to be here. Jess Walter's six acclaimed novels include the number one New York Times bestseller, Beautiful Ruins, the National Book Award finalist, The Zero, and Citizen Vince, winner of the Edgar Award. A former print journalist, he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for his coverage of the Ruby Ridge standoff. In his new novel, The Cold Millions, he follows the fortunes of two brothers living by their wits in early 20th century America. The book was called one of the most captivating novels of the year in the Washington Post. And now, Jess, the screen is all yours. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm so uh, pleased to get to talk about this novel. Uh, you spend years working on something like this, and it's sort of like a book that you've read that you can't wait to talk to people about, except it's one that you've actually written. So uh, as always, for me, book tour is such a pleasure to get to talk to people about the work and about um, um, what it is I've been obsessed with. Uh, because I wasn't able to go out on book tour like normal because of the pandemic, uh, and visit all these great cities and talk to readers. I thought how great if I could bring a little bit of Spokane and the book um, to readers. And so um, uh, I, with a filmmaker friend, I made a, a short five minute movie that I think we're gonna show now, um, a little bit of Ken Burnsian uh, background on um, Spokane and the 1909, um, free speech riots and the labor movement that um, that animated this novel. So with that, I'm going to show this short video and then I'll come back and read and talk a little bit. And then I'd love to answer any questions you might have about the book or writing or uh, anything at all. So with that, I think we'll start the film. I've always admired authors who create a fictional version of their real homes. The Albany of William Kennedy, Elena Ferrante's Naples, the Monterey Peninsula of John Steinbeck. Over the course of nine books, I've ventured far away to New York and the Zero, Italy and Hollywood and beautiful ruins, but I always find myself coming back to Spokane. They woke on a ball field, bums, tramps, hobos, stiffs. They floated in from mines and farms and log camps, filled every flop and boarding house, slept in parks and alleys, and on the night just past, this abandoned ball field. My new novel, The Cold Millions, begins here, Peaceful Valley, Spokane, Washington, 1909. The book mixes fiction and history in a way that's almost impressionistic, blending past events with present concerns. My first inspirations were these old postcards that I collect of my hometown from the early 1900s. Living in Spokane can feel like living among ghosts. Every day you walk in the turn of the 20th century, the buildings, the streets, the ground under your feet. This was a period I'd wanted to write about for years, the end of the last Gilded Age, when Spokane was only a few decades old, lurching from wild frontier town to modern city doubling in size every six or seven years to nearly the place it is now. Buildings that now house thriving coffee shops and brew pubs were once a mix of brothels and bars, banks and boarding houses, vaudeville theaters and flop houses for miners and farmers. Brutal cops and private detectives skulked downtown with rifles peeking out beneath their trench coats and thousands of itinerant workers, hobos, came by train from all over looking for work. This is the postcard that first sparked my imagination. As a writer, you stare at something like this and you can't help but wonder about the details, the things that live behind the official history, the packed street cars, the casinos, a woman in white moving across the frame, a man walking down a side street. This is where the novelist steps in to ask, what are they all doing down there? <laughs> 
The story I set out to tell was based on real events. The free speech riots of 1909 in Spokane and the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, the first union to take women, freed slaves, Native Americans, anyone with a job could be a Wobbly. It's a story of social unrest, of police brutality, of deep inequality, of the ache of wanting a better world, issues that resonate today. The IWW was outlawed from speaking and organizing on the streets. In Spokane, Wobblies staged the first successful nonviolent protests in U.S. history, a model for civil rights leaders and other peaceful activists. Speeches dissolved into riots, police and private goons beat protesters, there were mass arrests, 500 people locked up, the jails so full they threw prisoners in an old high school. The Cold Millions is the story of Gig and Ride Dolan, adventuring vagrant brothers who get swept up in this turbulent class warfare. It's also the story of two women they meet, Ursula the Great, who sings on a vaudeville stage with a live cougar, and the labor activist and suffragist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a courageous, pregnant 19-year-old who comes to Spokane to lead the fight for justice. My research involved books, academic papers, letters, hundreds of newspapers. But in Spokane, you can walk right through history, like walking through a neighborhood filled with the mansions of mining magnates or a simple clabbered house where Spokane's police chief was shot to death through the window by an assassin. The ghosts are everywhere. Even though it's fiction, I began to think of this novel as a loose origin story for my hometown, connecting the place we are now to the place we were then. But it's also a kind of origin story for my own working class family. Both of my grandfathers were itinerant workers in the West who found their way to Eastern Washington a generation later. My dad was a steel worker and union leader for 40 years. It's the truth of both history and historical fiction, I think, that the deeper you look into the past, the more you find yourself encountering the present moment. I know that was the case with the cold millions. These themes, the nature of progress, our endless struggle for social equality, they churn at the heart of this novel the way the Spokane River cuts through my western city, unceasing and inevitable, carving a path through time and stone to the ocean. Thank you for visiting my town. I hope you enjoy the cold millions. Places that appear in the novel um, uh, appear also in that film. Um, this was a very different novel for me. That, that my my ninth book um, and my seventh novel, and uh, I have not really written what I guess you'd call historical fiction. Uh, I've always liked bumping up against history and having um, actual characters, actual historical figures show up in my work. But this was really the 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 closest I've come to writing a straight historical novel. And it was um, fast, a fascinating thing to do. It was also a different skill set. I think I returned to my journalist background and I spent um, years researching this period, 1909, and the free speech riots, the early labor movement, uh, and the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world. Uh, research is an interesting thing for a novelist to do because it can you, you can find yourself um, so immersed in it that it's hard to get out. One of the um, one of the great quotes that I read recently was from a novelist that I love, Richard Powers, uh, who wrote The Overstory and so many other great novels. And someone asked him, do you get lost in research? And he had the greatest answer uh, and one that I really connect with. He said, no, I get found in research. Uh, and that's how I think about this story because I really did find it um, uh, in my research. I really did find the story I wanted to tell. I first came across the industrial workers of the world and their 
uh, and the free speech rights in my hometown. And uh, as a newspaper reporter, I was in the morgue, um, which is a terrific uh, uh, place for a reporter to go um, look things up. And coming across this story, I just thought, how has this never been told, this vibrant period? Um, I, I am drawn very much to to the contemporary times around me. And the first thing that I really wanted to try to capture was um, the income inequality of the world we live in now. Uh, we live at a time in, in which we are approaching the same inequity that, that um, occurred during the last Gilded Age. Um, and and I, I so wanted to be able to capture that, but not in a didactic way, in a way that felt to me captured in story. Uh, this, this story was um, uh, because it occurred in 1909 at the end of the Gilded Age was, was a way to write about uh, what we're going through now, um, but to do it in a way that, um, that was hopefully uh, could be built around the raucous and wild times that I, that I wanted to write about. The second impulse I had was to write something that felt more like a Western. I've lived in the West my entire life. I've lived in my hometown, Spokane, Washington. And uh, I've always avoided writing what you'd call a traditional Western. I even made fun of it sometimes. I would call it horse porn um, when I was talking to other writers. But there was something about the Western and the way it focuses on the sort of birth of civilization in these frontier areas, the way the degradation of the environment um, and of native tribes led to this, to the boom towns. And, and watching that in Spokane in, in this period in Seattle and the Northwest in the early 1900s when uh, mining and timber led to this explosive growth, um, I felt almost like I was I was looking at a story that was like Deadwood, uh, but with 100,000 people. And so that really was the, the period that I thought I could write about. And I could write it almost like a Western with these large archetypal characters, um, a larger than life story with violence and backstabbing and, um, and that whole world. And as I started thinking about this Western period and thinking about um, telling this a story in this form, uh, I thought of those Westerns that the classic Western form of a stranger riding into town and challenging um, the powers that be in that in that city. Uh, and when I thought of it that way, um, the real historical figure of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn started feeling like my stranger riding into town. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was a 19 year old pregnant labor activist who had left home at 15 to go west and to help organize um, uh, for labor in the in the battles uh, through Colorado and Minnesota and eventually to Montana and eventually to Spokane, Washington. And um, to imagine this Clint Eastwood figure as this um, brash, uh, irrepressible 19-year-old woman 10 years before she had the right to vote, having left her minor husband pregnant um, to, to battle on the street corners uh, and to demand um, not just the vote for women, but the emancipation of the vagina. I just thought, what an amazing character this would be. At the time in 1909, um, the other, some of the other parallels I thought about were the way in which the economy um, has driven uh, uh, has driven people to have to become essentially their own, their own employment. Um, uh, in, in the early 1900s, the railroad was connecting the world the way the internet has done for us and, and was upsetting um, the way people lived, the agrarian lifestyle. Uh, and all of a sudden people were driven away from their homes and their jobs uh, and had, and and very much had to fend for themselves. Um, and it reminded me so much of 
of the world we live in now, so many people driven to freelance, to the gig economy. And so uh, naming my two main characters, Ryan and Gregory Dolan, I came up with these nicknames for them, Ryan and Gig, which made me think very much about the gig economy, the, um, the precursor to the Lyft driver who has to provide his own car and his own insurance. And uh, it felt almost like an extension of the sort of transient hobo lifestyle that my characters gig and Ryan live. The third thing that really um, pushed me in writing this novel, the third contemporary thing, um, was the activism of young people. The Gigger and Rye are 23 and 16, and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is 19. And the, the way these young people um, uh, are driven by their passion and their idealism um, struck, just struck me as um, a kind of romantic thing that I wanted to find my, find my way into writing. Um, we can become cynical as we get older and, uh, and even thinking about the labor movement there, you can get lost thinking about the corruption of the, of, um, of, you know, later labor movements. But in 1909, in the early 1900s, it really is just an idea. It's, it's idealism at its, at its deepest root, that everyone should have a chance at uh, rising up in class and and providing for themselves and having a decent job. In Spokane in 1909, um, because of all these rail lines coming together, seven main railroads coming together in Spokane, Washington, it was both an economic center, but also a place where indigent workers, where itinerants, hobos, gathered um, hundreds, thousands uh, to, to look for work. And they had to go to job agencies, which were called job sharks then, and pay a dollar. And that dollar was then um, split often between a job foreman and the job agent. And then the, the, the worker would be fired after a few weeks so they could get another dollar from another worker. And this scam was what the industrial workers of the world were there to protest. Um, and, they, and because of that, the city, uh, um, banned speaking on the streets by union officials and others, and this was the cause of the free speech riots. And 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 thinking about um, the civil unrest that led that followed that, uh, more than 500 wobbly speakers were arrested and jailed, often brutally, packed into into tight uh, jail cells. Uh, one of which was an eight by seven foot. Um, a uh, cell beneath a steam vent that in which more than 20 workers were were packed and and that um w watching that uh watching this summer the um the black lives matter protests and and often the way they were br brutally treated um ref made me reflect on on these early um uh these early um, protests by the Wobblies and, and one of the first nonviolent protests in US history. And it made me think about those youthful figures over the last few years watching young people in, in uh, part in um, uh, protesting um, uh, violence in schools, gun shootings in schools, watching young people walk out of schools for for a response to climate change, and then watching the young activists in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, it just struck me that this was, again, a way to write about the current moment, to write um, uh, a novel that was con a contemporary historical novel, if such a thing were true. And the final thing that I that really swept me up in my research was language. Uh, and I'm gonna read just a short bit to talk about the language of the novel because um, there was a sort of song of 1909, the wobbly song, um, the song of, uh, of these itinerant workers, the song of Pinkerton detectives and vaudeville singers, of sheriffs and new immigrants to the country. It just had a, a, an energy and a freshness that I really wanted to capture. Um, so I'm just gonna read a quick bit about Gig and Rye and the life they were living um, before they get swept up in, these, in, um, the, in the action of the novel and in the labor movement. And after that, um, I'd like to, love to just answer any questions about the book that you might have. Uh, but I'm just gonna read a quick bit. Uh, this is Gig and Rye and, uh, and the life they're living as as uh, itinerant workers. <laughs> 
For a year, they moved, barely pausing for breath. They walked 20 miles some days and ran down freight on the slow edges of town, hopped box cars and crouched on the blinds between mail cars. Gig showed Rye his favorite way to travel, in the open, on flat cars and lumber racks, flying, he called it, wind in his face, sun on his arms. They flew and floated this way, job to job, week to week, farm to farm, Washington to Oregon to Idaho, until they landed a Jippo logging crew on the St. Joe River, Gig talking his way onto one end of a two-man misery whip. Rye ladling water and pounding wedges in the kerfs to keep the saws from binding. But they got run from that job too, replaced by the foreman's nephews. They followed rumors to interior farms and staggered harvests, bush wheat and picked huckleberries. The panic of 07 had run the banks and it was rare to find a boxcar or a barn without a vagrant in it. Most days they'd wait hours in line at the job sharks only to be told there was nothing for them. They huddled under burlap on boxcars, drank from streams and ate squirrel meat over jungle cook fires, boiled up their clothes and slept beneath stars, ducked train gangs and rail bulls. And if it wasn't an easy life, Rye would be lying if he didn't admit some adventure in it. Spokane was based for 5,000 floating workers and the brothers put on their best shirts and queued at some of the 30 employment agencies lining Stevens Street beneath bunk signs promising work for good men, $1 jobs, all for all, inquire within. A hard season for men, but lying was having a banner year. Rye acted sober, gig, Rye acted older, gig sober, and they forked a dollar for the pleasure of a 12 hour workday, knowing full well the shark was likely to split their buck with the straw boss and pull the job after two weeks for another crew at a dollar a man, churning them like water in a paddle wheel so no man could get a foothold. The Bunker Hill mine rotated 3,000 hungry muck muckers through 50 jobs that summer three grand in split fees with the bosses, the sharks bleeding them other ways too, subtracting two bits for doctoring, for stale bread, for a straw mattress. Then harvest over, they recast, recast the migrants as worthless bums and had security men knock their heads and drive them from town. So that's The Cold Millions. Uh, it's a rollicking novel full of, um, of betrayal and uh, and um, and much more history than I ever imagined I could squeeze into a novel. Uh, one of the nicest things someone said to me was that they googled most of the events in the book and were shocked to find out how much uh, had actually happened, and um, and that was both the thrill and the challenge of of harnessing all of that research. Um, uh, packing it into a novel and and letting the the real story hopefully carry while uh, these fictional characters Ryan Gig Dolan moved almost in tandem with uh, with what was really happening in those times. Um, so there is a Q and a um, bubble there for any questions and I think um, uh, uh, we can come back on and and uh, answer any questions you might have about the book. Good. Sure. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about your research for the language used in the book, just some of the rich vocabulary that your characters use when speaking with each other. It's colorful, it's fun, it's lively. I'd love to hear about your research. Yeah, uh, I, I read so many books from the period. The, um, this is one of my favorites, Rebel Voices, an IWW anthology, just full of, of songs and stories. And the, the Wobblies really were a sort of singing outfit. One of their, their, their main form of civil disobedience was to, um, was to go on streets where they weren't allowed to organize and sing until they were arrested and then thrown in jail, sing some more. Um, and when you're representing itinerant workers who don't really have any power, um, the only power they had was their bodies and their voices. And so there was a richness to that language that I just, I loved. The other thing that I really immersed myself in was old newspapers. And, and um, uh, the, this, the, that language was just so rich and, 
and it, it made me think of this fictional period that I was writing about the early 1900s. There aren't a whole lot of books from that period. There are some that I love. E.L. Doctorow's um, Ragtime is one of my favorite novels, and it has that same sort of musical ragtime quality. In fact, I, it uh, almost froze me. That book is so good. Um, but uh, but as I was thinking about this period, it felt like such an in-between border time. And I kept imagining I was writing something that was between the Western and the noir. Uh, and I so wanted to capture that. Uh, and especially with these characters that were, there's a character in the novel who's a Pinkerton detective. And I realized the Pinkertons were sort of the dawn of what we think of as detective fiction. So that had me reading late 19th century and early 20th century detective fiction, uh, and especially British detective fiction, because so many of the Pinkerton detectives came from Scotland and England. And as I read it, I, I, I kept coming across these words and, and language that I had been lost to the culture. And one of my favorites was the Morbs. Um, there's a character named Del Dalvo who announces himself by saying, Spokane gave me the Morbs. And the Morbs is a feeling of unease, a disquiet. Uh, anyone who lived through 2020 knows exactly what the Morbs is. Um, 2020 is the Morbs. And, uh, and so Dell, who would not feel, um, uh, who, who would feel lobcocked and batty fanged. And um, it, was, it was so great to, to just be able to use that language and feel like I was creating almost the missing link between, um, you know, this, a style of writing that we are familiar with, the Western uh, and the noir detective novel. The title for the book is used at a moment of realization for Rye. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about that moment and why you chose this title. Yeah, it's funny that uh, originally when I thought the book would be even more of a Western, um, I, I had thought it was going to be called Nothing West of Dead. So there are still a few places on the website, on the, the internet, where you can see that I have a book coming out called Nothing West of Dead. So don't buy that one because it doesn't exist. Um, and I was, I was writing, as often happens, I don't outline. I just sort of work my way through stories. And I was... Uh, I had realized something about both brothers that um, that books would be the um, the sort of social escalator for them, the 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 way in which they would aspire for more. Um, Gig is very much um, part of what was called the ho the vast hobo library. Um, so many transients at the time carried in their in their packs and their bindles um, a book and maybe it was a Jack London book or maybe it was um, uh, Madame Bovary by Flaubert but there were always well-read hobos and they would exchange books out on the road and they called this the vast hobo library um, and I love that about Gig that he was that he was someone who um, read economics and politics and found his way into, into early labor that way. Uh, and Rye, for him, books represented something a little different. It's the way, because he's so young, this is his coming of age. And his brother's favorite book is War and Peace. He's, he's, uh, Gig has, has two volumes of War and Peace, two of the five that he's uh, looking for, and has pronounced it the greatest work of fiction in uh, in the world, even though he's only read two fifths of it. And Rye's understanding of his brother is through books. So there's a scene fairly early in the novel when he's sitting in a library um, with Lem Brand, who is um, the, a mining magnate and a millionaire. And he's sitting in this beautiful library with floor to ceiling books, um, radiant heat in the floor, sipping uh, brandy and eating cookies. And he has this moment where he weeps a little for his brother who loves books so much and will never be in a room like this. And that causes him to sort of weep for all of humanity. And in that moment, he thinks about the cold millions out there who will never know um, how many layers of wealth there are between them and someone like Len Brand. And when I typed that phrase, I had this sort of shiver and thought, I'm not writing nothing west of dead. I'm writing this book about class and about aspiring for more. And I realized at that moment that this was the book I was writing. And I, that very day I went and changed the title on the, on the Word document and, and knew that was gonna be the title of the book. That's great, thank you.
this question uh, from the audience. Two questions, actually. The Kaiser poster behind you, what's, yes. what's the origin and meaning? And did you have a literary model for the novel from which you wrote? Oh, those are two great questions. I'll answer the Kaiser question first. Um, as I said, I come from a working class family. I'm a first generation college student, the first male in my direct line to graduate from high school. And both of my grandfathers, my grandpa Ralph was an itinerant worker um, who uh, during the Great Depression made his way west with the Okies and worked in the fields of California and later, um, a year before I was born, died on a road crew when a crane fell on him. My other grandfather, Grandpa Jess, um, who my names, who I'm the namesake of, was a rancher who rode around the West um, uh, on train cars looking for work, and that's how he arrived in Spokane. And so I felt like I was honoring my family a little bit. Well, my dad, who uh, grew up on Grandpa Jess's ranch, worked at Kaiser Aluminum for uh, 40 years. Um, uh, and was the president of his steelworkers union, a uh, high school dropout whose father was a vagrant worker and his path to the middle class was labor. And so um, this novel was very much for me a, a way to honor um, the working class roots of my family and my dad, who we had no religion growing up, but I was taught fairness through a, a union, through labor. And um, to watch the way uh, labor was um, minimized and, and, um, and demonized throughout from the 1980s on um, has been a difficult thing to me. And to watch the way that the working class um, you know, was blamed for everything from, uh, uh, you know, union corruption to Donald Trump has been a hard thing because for me, um, labor was, you know, created the vast middle class, helped create the vast middle class in America um, for 50, 60 years. And, and this novel was a way to kind of honor the early roots of that. Again, the idealism of it, the simple idea that, um, that workers should share in the profits that they create. It's such a beautiful story, really, of brotherhood. Um, but there are also some pretty fascinating female characters. One yeah. that really struck me was Ursula the Great. And I wonder if you would talk about her a little bit. A, of course, was she real? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, did that really happen? Um, and just a little bit about writing her character. Sure. Yeah, it was um, because Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is such a prominent character in the novel. Um, I knew I was going to going to write some scenes with her in it and, and write from her point of view. The novel is told in third person with Gig and Rye um, sort of looking over their shoulders through most of the novel. Um, but then these first person voices come in and it was important to me um, if I created Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, this irrepressible, bold female um, character who refuses to adhere to the to the rules of the time, that I also create someone who um, was who had to live within that system. Who had and Ur Ursula the Great was the character who who I sort of landed on. Um, Ursula is a, um, she's actually the second Ursula. The first Ursula has um, aged out of the job, but uh, she performs on stage in an elaborate show where she sings and dances around a caged mountain lion uh, as she slowly strips and goes inside the cage. And um, she, and it's funny that you ask if she's real. This is how immersive my research was. Um, I was researching the vaudeville theaters at the time and there were so many acts that involved animals and things just like this. People would wrestle bears and punch horses to the ground and um, women were constantly, you know, um, uh, you know, slow stripping for various things. And so I, uh, I was in, I was doing my research and I was looking at all of these, I was looking through newspaper microfilm and writing down all sorts of different acts, but I was also coming up with in, inventing different acts as I was doing it. And when I got home that night, I looked in my notes and I saw Ursula the Great sings and dances with a wild cougar. And I couldn't remember if I'd read about it and made it up. 
And so I had to go back to the library the next day and go through all, repeat my research before I realized I had invented her. I had read all, all these things and, uh, and had invented this character, Ursula the Great. So um, she's not a historical figure, but she really could have existed on those uh, wild stages in the West at the time. That's great. Another question from our audience tonight. Um, could you speak a little about the process of writing this book since you did not outline it? Did you write a lot of material that went unused and were there a lot of drafts? Yeah, I, um, when I say I don't outline, I do outline, but I do it at the very end, almost to see what I've done. Uh, I get out big pieces of butcher paper and I write exactly how many pages um, because this novel has third person and first person, I, I wrote on that big piece of butcher paper, the third person sections in black and the first person sections in red, just to see sort of what the balance of the novel was. Um, the, oh, I, I forgot to answer the other question about, uh, about kind of uh, uh, literary models for this book, but because War and Peace is such a, an important book for those characters. I told myself that I would have the same general structure as War and Peace, four sections and an epilogue. And so um, that was about the only outline I had much of the way. Uh, for me, a, a novel comes together when, a, when the idea coalesces with characters that I've started to imagine and the characters are people that I care about and want to know more about. And then the third element that really has to come in is language. And I was spending so much time in 1909 that I felt like I was becoming conversant and fluent in it. And using that language to animate those characters um, into a story that I wanted. Those, when those th three things come together like tributaries of a river, then the flow is strong enough. Um, and I, and I, I knew that I had the free speech riots of 1909 to craft around. And so that takes away some of the outlining for you. You know, I know I'm gonna get to the free speech riots, 500 people are gonna get arrested. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's gonna come to town, um, but I don't know what's gonna happen around that or between it. I know that I wanna write Pinkerton detectives and I want there to be questions of loyalty throughout. So as those things start to accrue and add up, the story starts to find its way. Um, and then the other thing you asked was about, you know, the uh, um, whether or not there were sections that fell away, and there always are. Um, the writing sort of organic, organically like that, you'll write sometimes a character sketch that will fall away. Um, there, the the one thing that jumps to mind, there was a lot more Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in the novel, a lot more from her point of view. And I realized two things. One, that the main job of a labor organizer is to go around giving speeches and no one wants to read a novel full of speeches. Uh, and the second thing I realized was that um, even though she's not the protagonist of the novel, she is the hero, as I said, and that, that she was almost better uh, with a little more distance from her, with a little more mystery. Um, Rai's feelings for her are so deep and he admires her as much as maybe he has a crush on her. And that admiration um, and, that, and that sort of holding her on a pedestal worked better if she had a smaller part of the novel. So I ended up having to cut about 30 pages of her, of her personal story. Um, this novel has the longest acknowledgments I've ever written because I wanted to steer people to the real, um, to the historical um, uh, sources that I use so that people could go read her autobiography, The Rebel Girl, or um, the other biographies of her, or the other stories that, uh, that, that led to this book. This next question from our audience says, I'm intrigued by the ball field in the video. My stream skipped at that point. Can you give more background about it and how it fits into the novel? Um, it, yeah, so there, uh, Spokane is, I, I encourage you to go to jesswalter.com and watch the whole video because um, the filmmaker I worked with has some beautiful drone shots and you really get to see the place this started. But the ball field uh, exists. There was a baseball field right down along the river um, in a place called Peaceful Valley. And uh, I, um, the place that I would go to breakfast every morning was right across the river from that ball field. And I love the idea of the, um, so many of the tramps at that time, the 
um, the workers could not sleep downtown because they would get rousted by the police. So they would go down the hill into Peaceful Valley, this little um, neighborhood right along the river. And so I, I almost from the beginning, I imagine my workers waking up on a baseball field. It was the sport of 1909. It was, you know, baseball was so wildly, um, uh, wildly popular. And I knew there had been a baseball field down there forever. You know, there was one sitting there while I, while I looked. Uh, it wasn't until I was about um, to the outlining stage that I went down and looked at that baseball field and saw it had been built in 1912. And so it was three years later than my novel. And uh, I like to joke sometimes that you, at some point you have to fire the, as a fiction writer, you have to fire the whole research department. And so I fired the research department and decided my ball field would be in the same place uh, a few years earlier. And, um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, it really exists as almost all the locations in the novel do. Um, almost all of them were, um, you know, places that I could walk around. And as I said in, in the video, living in a place that, um, that, that grew so, um, so uh, exponentially during that period, uh, I, I have lived in three houses, all of them built between 1905 and 1908. Uh, and the carriage house that I'm in right now is a 1908 River Rock carriage house. So um, it's, it's very much, while I was writing a historical novel, as I said, I felt like uh, you know, that I was in that place, that I was living among those ghosts um, everywhere I went in Spokane. We've got just one last question from our audience, and it is, what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? Um, well, as an author, they keep sending you things for blurbs. So um, I'm reading a lot of other writers work um, and really enjoying it. Um, but uh, it's, it, I don't know about most of you, but it was difficult to read much. You know, first during the pandemic, you were just constantly checking the news and then the election. I feel like the novel I read the most was 538.com this year, um, uh, but uh, I, I did um, have to sort of force myself to read. I, I made a deal with my phone that when it got up to six hours one week that I had, that apparently I'd spent on it daily, that I would shave three of those hours off and start reading more. Um, I read uh, a couple of really great short books about um, pandemic life. Zadie Smith's Intimations was just wonderful. Um, a book by Bill Hayes. I can't recall the title about, um, uh, was another great one. And then um, I also told myself I was going to read novels that I had missed while, um, uh, you know, at the time. And I had not read Wolf Hall. And I thought, I'm writing a historical novel. I should read Wolf Hall. And sometimes for me, those novels that everyone else is reading are like crowded restaurants. I think, I'll wait until there's less of a crowd. And, but the problem with that is when you read it 10 years later than everyone else, you have no one to talk about it with. You know, everyone, I'm like, have you read Wolf Hall? And they're like, yeah, 10 years ago. Um, and that was just amazing. Uh, I also, because I'm working on short stories next, I, I, immersed myself in short stories, Alice Munro, um, James Baldwin's uh, um, Sonny's Blues. Um, uh, and, that, and that's been great fun, you know, reading uh, classic short stories. Thank you so much, Jess, for your immersive, beautiful book. And thank you very much to our audience for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day or night, wherever you are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone.